Oh, okay, okay. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Okay. You're a grown ass man, you're a grown ass man. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. It's just a series of children's books. Just a series of children's books. You can do this. There's nothing actually scary about this. These are campfire stories. Heard them a million times, mostly public domain. There is nothing that they can put in this movie that's gonna scare you. Nothing at all. You were scared in grade school, not scared now. Scared in high school, not scared now. It's certainly not like they're gonna find the one fucking thing in there that still genuinely terrifies you to your very core. No! Fuck! No! No! Not! No! Not do- No! Someone else! Get someone else. I, I need the money. You need the money? You need the money? I actually really do need the money. So this is a strange movie, because it's kind of a strange thing to try and adapt into a movie in the first place. If you're not familiar, which I feel like maybe if you weren't a late Gen X or early millennial in grade school in the United States in the 80s and 90s, maybe you aren't. Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was this trilogy of children's books by Alan Schwartz where basically he collected his own rewritten variations of old campfire ghost stories and urban legends and spooky folklore, just different enough versions of these things that, you know, like the call is coming from inside the house, the other driver's trying to warn you about the guy hiding in the back seat, that chick you met last night was a ghost, that kind of thing. Most of them were suitably creepy, a few of them were especially memorable, one or two were borderline super gruesome, which gave the whole thing a sense of the forbidden and taboo. They used to try to ban these all the time. But if you ask the people who remember them, the near universal thing that seems to stuck in everyone's head was the nightmarish, often surreal, and occasionally only vaguely connected to the story in question illustrations by Steve even gamble, which were, I'm not even sure how to describe this to fucking hell. Stop putting that one up there. I mean it. So blockbuster nostalgia property, but how do you bang a movie out of it when it's a couple of dozen extremely well-worn stories not really connected to one another and most of them meant to be live read over the course of like two minutes at a sleepover with the somewhat narrow target audience of kids exactly too old for R.L. Stein, but exactly too young for Eli Roth. In this case, they went with the Goosebumps movie, but darker, not funny, and with a liberal glaze of off-brand Stephen King pastiche. Set in a small town of definitely not just Derry in 1968 over the week between Halloween and the impending presidential election of Richard Nixon, a uh, spoiler warning, I guess. May death come quickly to his enemies. <laughs> the story involves a group of local misfit teenagers who, while hiding from some bullies in the local do not go in their creepy old house on the edge of town, discover a cursed book of ghost stories supposedly composed by the town's local urban legend, the supposedly child-killing homebound mad daughter of the now-deceased founding family. Now awoken once again, the book unleashes a handful of the most well-remembered ghosts, monsters, and or tableaus from these scary stories books in order to hunt the group down and dispatch them until one of them figures out that they should try and solve the inevitable deeper secrets mystery of the ghost author herself in order to stop the curse. So originality is obviously not the strong suit of this one, though that's kind of inevitable when we're talking about a nostalgia project that's itself based on stories that were in some cases older than the written word. On the other hand, you definitely do notice that there's a lot, and I mean a lot, of plot employed in order to get everything into position for what turns out to be a two-word plot scenario of Haunted Book. To the point where it feels unnecessarily complicated, and I expect that there was some post-production reworking involved. The book is cursed and full of ghost stories, but it also writes new ghost stories stories for the people it's going to kill, some of which are based on dreams that they've had or drawn from other stories that scared them when they were kids, but in both of those cases we aren't informed of that connection until it just happens, and I'm thinking, that's a lot of unnecessary extra plot machinery when all you're really doing is setting up how the scarecrow, the where's my toes zombie, and the 
yeah, the one that looks like Sarah Huckabee Sanders if she was the grudge, you're gonna jump out and scare people. Add to that the welcome but curious fact that half the cast is acting its ass off as though there's a chance for serious dramatic recognition here, while the other half is more acutely aware that they're making a just gory enough PG-13 teen horror movie and the recurring Nixon 60s racism Vietnam illusions that play out as though someone assumed that putting important history in the background would just organically generate meaningful subtext without actually having to write it. And it's kind of a schizophrenic narrative, to put it mildly. But fortunately, most of that doesn't really end up mattering in the end. Like, that probably sounded like a negative review I was building up to, but in spite of taking a bit too long to get going, taking itself too seriously, and being a little convoluted and too easy to figure out, as youth-oriented horror movies go, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark is pretty damn solid. It's well-paced, the atmosphere works, the period detail feels authentic, the scares are very genuine, the creatures look awesome, the gore is good, the young cast is solid, and much like the books, there's some really nasty stuff squeezed into the PG-13 limits of acceptability. Yeah, they do the spider thing, and that's gonna shake the younger kids up, I think. You really can probably chalk that up to director Andre Overdahl, who's now three for three between this, The Autopsy of Jane Doe, and Troll Hunter. You should see both of those if you get the chance. This guy is just a flat-out excellent visual stylist and a great director, and when the material is somewhat thin, even then he's making it look and play well enough that it feels more substantive than it otherwise might. Now, I don't know if this is a classic, but it's got some awkward issues, and I'm not sure that the franchise was ever supposed to be in motion or even off the page, but there's some great set pieces here, and it really works, and yeah, I think if you're a fan, you're going to enjoy it, and even if you're not a fan, you'll find a lot here to like. I'm going to say 7 out of 10, it gets the job done.